All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, let's get started. My name is Andy Nauman. I work for IBM here in Austin. Uh, it's weird to hear your voice reflecting. Uh, I've, I've worked for there for about 15 years now uh, on the WebSphere application server products, if you're familiar at all with those. Um, I've held various job roles there, uh, whatever the, the popular term of the day is, build, release, engineering, DevOps, continuous delivery. Currently, I'm called the continuous delivery team lead, um, but basically my position's always been how do we build, test, and get the product out as fast as we can. So what am I here to talk about today? Um, and it is a conversation, we'll have the open space afterwards. I'm gonna talk about kind of the growth of WebSphere Liberty, the product, um, and how we have kind of coped with that from our continuous delivery point of view um, through the seven years it's been around. So uh, it started in 2012, the idea was to have a smaller composable version of WebSphere uh, and um, at the time, we had a couple of people working on it. They set up their own build system. It ran a few builds every day. Um, they had a few thousand test cases initially in the product. Fast forward to today, um, you know, we just released our 1904 version last week. Um, we're, we're, we now have lots of developers working on the product. Um, we have an open source side that's had 166 contributors. Um, we also have our commercial one I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we're running, if you look at our entire build and test infrastructure, we're running hundreds of builds every day. We're running millions of test cases every day that kind of spread from being pretty simple to very complicated. Um, so what makes Liberty special? I just want to kind of mention these things. This is what drives a lot of our strategy, but I'm not going to get too into them. I'm going to focus more on our development process. Um, it's a big enterprise product. Uh, when we go to test it, it's supported on all kinds of different you know, operating systems, JVMs. Um, if we kick off our full test suite, it's 208 different combinations running you know, hundreds of thousands of tests on each, so that's where our infrastructure gets so big. Uh, service, one of the things IBM uh, software prides itself on is the support. Uh, what that means for us, supporting the product, is that if we ship a fix pack, there's always the chance that a customer will decide never to upgrade for about 10 years and then come back to us and say, hey, we need a fix on top of that. Can you give me that? And we have to be able to build it. So anything we put into our build or test infrastructure, we have to make sure it can stay around and work for you know, decades into the future. Um, we're a worldwide team, uh, contributors from all over the world, so it's not as easy if we roll something out saying, hey, step into the conference room, we'll show you this new tool. We need a good way to get our instructions out there uh, for everyone to consume. Um, it's split into two pieces. Uh, in 2017, we decided to open source a lot of the product. Um, that just made our lives more complicated. We're now building, you know, two different products. Uh, they depend on each other, um, just added some more complication for us. And then we're on a monthly release cycle, which really means uh, that's quicker than we used to be. And it means that it's that much more important to keep our builds clean and ready to release at any time, because we always have that next release right around the corner. Um, so what is a Liberty build? I'm going to talk about builds. Uh, it's actually way more than a build. We build through our product code. That's pretty quick. We build our test code. Then we go and execute about 70,000 tests that, that range from very simple unit tests to very complicated function tests. Um, if, you would, if you would execute that all end to end, it's about 60 hours. We have some parallelizing going on, so it takes us about eight hours, which is a long time, but we've kind of been okay with that to get that amount of testing done. So this is the main thing I want to focus on. This is kind of how our development flow has grown through the years um, as things got more complicated. So say you have your issue come in, you want to start working on it. Um, this is broken into three pieces. There's the development piece, which is like your local development, delivery, getting it checked into source control, and then the production builds to get it out to the customer. So. Uh, you get your issue coming in, you write your code, you build it locally, you test it, and then you repeat a few times to figure it out. Um, from our continuous delivery kind of infrastructure team, what have we done to help just that local development? Well, so what has not worked that we've done? We used to have static instructions out on a website, limited people have access to update it. Really doesn't work because it just never stays up with what the latest stuff is. 
um, doing a big comprehensive build. Originally, if you ran a build, it was built the entire product, every possible offering, all that stuff. Um, as the product grows, we can't do that. You need to be able to get some small testable piece out as quickly as possible, or else people just aren't going to do it locally, and you're going to get problems further down the line. Same with our test setup. It needs to be as simple as possible so that people actually do it, and you're not catching your problems down the line in, in production. Um, so what has worked, simple living instructions, keep your, you know, wiki with your GitHub code, um, encourage people to update it as often as possible, um, keep, it, keep it in sync with what's actually going on, make it as usable as possible for new people coming in so that you don't have the toil of teaching those people by hand, they can just go off the documents. Um, fast build of the minimal product and then have optional steps to get more than that. If there's something extra you need to test, just have an easy task for that to run, but make the, the simple testable thing as quick as possible. Um, fast and easy text execution so that people actually can do it. And then um, just a quick thing, we moved our source code management to GitHub a couple years ago. Um, before we were in this system that took forever to load code. Um, it was GUI based, so it was really hard to automate. No, no good command line interface. GitHub has been a huge improvement for us. So back to the flow, once you're, once you're happy with your local changes, you open your pull request in GitHub, which says, you know, I wanna deliver these changes. You get your code review from somebody who knows the code. And then there's two possible paths. They either send you back to fix something or you merge it to the integration branch. So integration branch is where all of our changes are coming in, um, everybody's dropping everything, and then we run our continuous build. That continuous build is the eight hour build I talked about. We're running 70,000 tests. Uh, once that's clean, uh, it pushes everything to the master branch. Most people are familiar with that. Against that, we run the release build, which is almost like the continuous build with a little bit extra. And then after the release builds good, we get our happy customer. There's also a lot of platform testing and things like that going on, but for the flow, this is, uh, this is what we're going with. Um, so that is all good, but in reality, when this was our flow, what did we hit? The continuous build was always breaking. And the problem is the local test step you're only running a few tests related to your code, what you can think to test. When you get to the continuous build, it's testing all the interactions of all the code. You don't realize you know, some of the dependencies that you might have broken. And the bad thing is the continuous build stops everybody because nothing's making it to master. It's a big delay in the process. So what we introduced is the personal build, um, which is basically we'll give you the infrastructure to run a full a f the full test suite against your changes before you deliver. So it's going to slow you down in your development process, but you're not going to hurt everyone else if you have a problem in your code. Two possible paths out of that, either you go back and fix some problems in your personal build or you get to uh, uh, deliver and everything's running smoothly. That's not actually perfect. We still get breaks in our continuous build, so there's still the case where we find a bad change and we revert it back to the coding phase, but everything else gets to keep moving on. So let's talk about build breaks. I said a little bit about that. We break it into two pieces, or two classifications. Um, we have a hard break, which is any compiler unit test error. Those should always be passing no matter what. And then for function tests, those are our more complicated tests that are more susceptible to you know, infrastructure problems, stuff like that. If it's happening more than a third of the time, that's a hard break, we need to get it out of there. If it's intermittent less than a third of the time, we'll let it stay, but we're gonna bug you to, to fix it. Um, some statistics over, across all of our testing, all of our platforms that we're running, 99.8% we're passing, which sounds great. But the problem is we're running so many tests that it means that we have about 2,000 failing buckets every day, which is way more than anyone can sort through. So what we had to do was introduce some build monitoring practices. Um, we came up with some automated, uh, automated um, tools to help with that. Um, basically, they look at every build that comes out. They compare any test errors that might have shown up in that build against all of our open build break issues. If something matches, it'll just associate the build to it, so we have an idea of how much an issue is impacting us, so priorities can, can be impacted by that. 
And then if it's a new problem, it'll open a new issue so we can start to track it and bug somebody to fix it. Um, on the other side, we have a manual monitoring job which rotates through the development organization to kind of keep everyone familiar with the build process, invested in it. Um, their job is to watch mostly that continuous build, identify any hard breaks that show up in it, find the problem and revert it if anything bad is in the continuous build as quick as we can. Um, and then also to look at kind of the results as a whole, see if there are any things that are technically intermittent but are hitting us a lot and we need to tag those to get some more attention on it um, and you know get it worked. So how have we handled build breaks? What has, and what has and hasn't worked for us? So at first, we thought every test should pass every time. That got really ugly because it turned into, you know, we have a release coming out and we're resubmitting the build until it's green and it's miserable because we have some little intermittent flaky test that's killing us. When you get that many tests running, you're bound to get some errors involved. Um, automatic reverts of everything, so we had it for a while. If the continuous build breaks, everything new in it just gets reverted automatically. The bad thing is you have a lot of developers uh, contributing code, say 10 people checked in code between the two continuous builds. One of them made a mistake and you're punishing the other nine, making them re-deliver their change. Made for very unhappy developers, uh, and so we didn't do that anymore. That's why that's still a manual step, figuring out what we really need to revert. Um, and then uh, automatic retries of all the failed tests. For a while we said, well, we're gonna you know, eliminate the intermittent problems from affecting us by just rerunning failed tests. The problem was we're running so many tests already, you get a couple intermittent breaks, you're running more and more builds, it just overwhelms our infrastructure. Also, it just ignores those intermittent failures, which might indicate some actual product code problem or just a badly written test that needs to be fixed. So what has worked? Introducing the personal builds, letting people test their code fully before they integrate or before they merge it, that's great. Um, Reverting bad, bad breaks uh, immediately, that's always a good thing. Um, get those out of there and let everything else make progress. And then selective retries. In our personal builds, we don't do retries. They can use those build monitoring tools to kind of see what broke in my build, are these known problems, or is one of them new, and do I need to look and see if I cause that new problem. Um, and then the continuous release build, we do, for every failure, we go ahead and retry it twice. If the two retries pass, we still call it technically a good build that either pushes the master or we can, uh, we can technically ship. So this is our flow. This is all working for us pretty well, but we start to hear a lot of complaints about the bottleneck in the process, which is that personal build. Everyone's waiting eight hours for their changes to get in. Uh, so it's too slow. Um, as we started to break the build up into optional steps, it got complicated to know what to submit based on your changes, what, what tests do you need to run, things like that. Um, uh, intermittent problems, I talked about the build monitoring. It was hard to sort through what's an error I might have caused and what's a known error. Um, and then uh, if I have a simple enough change, if I'm just you know fixing a typo in some message, I shouldn't need to run 70,000 tests on it. I should be able to just go ahead and put that in. So what hasn't worked? Required personal builds. That made for some miserable people waiting for their changes to get in. And then tools that enforce requirements on the delivery. Um, you know, enforcing you have to run a personal build, it has to have executed all the tests. Uh, you have to manually explain how you tested your changes locally. We experimented with some stuff like that. Again, more toil for your developers, not very happy about it. So what has worked? Trusting your developers. Generally, they're gonna know, is this a change that, you know, isn't gonna impact much, it's safe, I'm just gonna put it in, or is it something that could potentially have some weird dependencies and I do wanna run all the tests? And then also some automated tools that our team has put in. Um, we have a GitHub webhook program that runs. Um, you can just, in any pull request, you can just do hashtag build in a comment and that'll submit that personal build for you and it'll look at what actual code changes you made in your, in your, in your pull request and use that to decide what, um, 
what tests should run, what parts of the build don't really have to run, and the effect that's had is that it cuts our um, build time, personal build times at least, down from an eight hour average to about a four hour average, which is way better when developers are trying to iterate and get their changes in. Um, there's still the occasional eight hour change if you're changing something in the infrastructure, in the core code, um, but that's good, we're getting it fully tested. Um, and then also the automated build monitoring tool I talked about helps people sort through what's the problem and stuff. Uh, is it something I caused or is it a known problem? So that's all good. Um, we fixed some things about the personal build by introducing that hashtag build and allowing people to merge, trusting them to do the right thing. And that kind of ends up being our final current uh, delivery process that we're working with. It's working pretty well for us, it's not perfect. Um, so what are some other things we've tried through the years of the product? So at first it started out, it was a nice small team. We thought everyone can own the build. We don't have to have a dedicated DevOps, continuous delivery, whatever you want to call it, team. Um, you know, the developers are going to be invested. They're going to fix the builds. Uh, the problem is, as the, as the code gets bigger, the build gets more complicated, developers get busy with their feature work and fixing problems, the build kind of falls apart, it gets ugly. That's when they sort of brought our team in to you know, help out with the overall process. Um, the idea of, I'm gonna write my product code now, this is probably very self-explanatory to people here, but I'm gonna write my product code now, I'll come back and write the tests later. That never works, you never come back and write your tests, you end up with code that might regress in the future, you're not gonna catch it. And then the idea of, well, we need to get this release out, so I'm gonna make it work for now, and I'll come back and fix it up later. And what you end up with is something really ugly in your code that you're supporting for decades in the future. So uh, what has worked for us, our, our dedicated DevOps team, once we got some people actually working on the process, it's cleaned up a lot and gotten a lot smoother. Um, a strong build infrastructure, I don't have time to go into it much, but uh, moving to you know, virtual systems, containers as much as we can, automatic provisioning to, to support the amount of builds and tests that we're going through, that's the only way we can get that amount of testing on the code um, before it gets in. Uh, keeping test metrics so we can keep an eye on our tests. You know, a lot of people write their test and forget about it. We can keep an eye on it, see if something's taking way too long to run, slowing down our overall process. Um, also, when we're, when we're running a bunch of tests in parallel, it lets us balance the load across all the systems so that we can, um, we can uh, have everything run the same amount of time and shorten the overall build time. And then also we adopted Slack, uh, which is way better than former communication tools that we've used. Um, and that has certainly helped with notifications, you know, discussion, keeping track of all the status. What problems do we still struggle with? Long build times, long test times. Um, you know, eight hours isn't great. We're, we're definitely working on speeding that up. We have a lot of ideas. Infrastructure reliability, if the infrastructure goes down, if there's a problem, all of our builds and tests start breaking. It's a huge blocker in the, in the pipeline. So, uh, and then intermittent errors, um, you know, if, if we find ourselves letting those pile up, uh, it can be a pretty, pretty major problem because you're taking that much longer, you're doing that much, many more retries. So as those kind of um, pile up, as they happen, we really need to get focused on fixing them so that it's done. So that's it. Um, I will be up in the open space in like 20 minutes or whenever it starts. Um, hopefully if anybody's had you know, similar experiences with a growing product, if you think we're doing things wrong and you have ideas for how we can improve, that'd be great. Um, and that's it. Thanks a lot. <clears throat>